Good morning, everyone. Hello uh, and welcome. We are so excited to have this inaugural event, which is around rural health and research in British Columbia. We have just a, a fantastic set of presentations today. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to do um, our land acknowledgement. Um, I just want to say that I am absolutely privileged to be speaking to you today from the Shwetmet territory here in Eagle Bay, British Columbia, along the beautiful Shushwap. I'd like to take a moment too, if you'd like to share your land acknowledgements, your territory within the chat box, please feel free to do so. My name is Dee Taylor. Uh, I am one of the of two co-scientific directors. Dr. Nellie Oki is my partner. She of course is in the other room and the other set of uh, presentations. I get the great honor and privilege of uh, hosting our series of presentations this morning. Um, just to give you a little background, uh, so Nellie and I's positions started in around uh, spring, just actually just before uh, or while COVID was hitting. And we have um, the great honor of as scientific director, as Ray say, as says, Dr. Ray Markham says, to help the RCCBC's activities line up with uh, the evidence, so to speak. And we both acknowledge that uh, the RCCBC is doing some incredible work right now in, in evidence. And uh, we're excited to be here today um, to sort of, as I said, uh, enjoy the conversations as well as um, just let you know about more about the RCCBC for those of you that don't know. Um, and I also have the privilege of being uh, the Corporate Director of Research for Interior Health. So lots of research, lots of intersections, lots of wonderful things happening in, in the province around um, re research and health research. It's very uh, an exciting time. And again, like I said, I, I'm just thrilled to be part of, of this morning and joining you today. So just seeing all of the land acknowledgements coming in, thank you very much for doing that. Um, just to give you a note of how things are going to go today, uh, as I said, we're, we're going to be um, having not quite um, a Pecha Kucha form where it's, it's super fast, but it's going to be quick. It's a way to give our audience a, a sense of the amazing work that's happening in research across the province. So I am going to keep everybody on time. Uh, for those of you that are joining in and out, by all means, you can hop in and out and you won't disrupt um, any of the presenters or uh, any of the, the people on the line. We've got it set up so that you can join in on a presentation and, and switch around between the rooms. Uh, we are expecting over 100 people in, in the audience or more. Um, so that's, that's exciting. Uh, for the presenters, I'm going to ask you to uh, introduce yourself and, and the uh, subject of the presentation that you're, you're giving. For those of you in the audience, if there's questions, there is going to be some time at the end of each presentation to ask one or two things about, uh, about the presentation. Uh, if there's questions beyond that, we'll um, aim to get uh, those questions out to each of the presenters. And if you have questions for either myself or Nelly, uh, in terms of, so what is that? What does it mean to be a scientific director for RCCBC? Um, we'll have some email contacts for you as well so that you can reach out to us directly. It's been absolutely uh, an amazing experience so far. Um, and uh, both Nelly and I are just, uh, are really happy to, to reach out and chat with all of you about health research and really highlight the incredible innovativeness of rural, uh, what's going on in rural uh, British Columbia, rural and remote. There are some remote um, um, op opportunities as well. So anybody that feels like they wanna have a conversation with us, please let us know. All right, uh, without further ado, um, we are meant to go on at 8.40. Um, maybe we've got just a couple of minutes uh, there's still uh, people coming in in terms of um, uh, acknowledgements, but I think what we'll do, uh, Dr. Watchcom, you are 
on and let's maybe allow for a little bit of flex in our schedule. We can get started a few minutes ahead if you're ready to go. Sure, I'll just uh, share my screen here. Perfect, thank you so much. Perfect. Hi everyone, thanks very much for, for having me. It's a, a privilege to, to present this work that I've been working on. Um, so my name's uh, Adam Watchorn. I'm uh, an eMERGE doc and family doc who lives in Golden, uh, BC. And um, I, I've mainly um, focused my research on rural transfers. And my title for this research is lack of a CT scanner in a rural British Columbia hospital leads to unnecessary transfers and a delay to emergent imaging. So as I said, I, I live in Golden. I've been here for about 10 years and I work mostly in the eMERGE and have been involved with hundreds of patient transfers. And I've seen firsthand <clears throat> how the lack of resources in my town uh, directly affects patient care. Early on in my career, I had a hard time dealing with that, uh, especially dealing with transport cases that went wrong. And I sent um, early on numerous complaints to BC EHS, health authorities, politicians, and uh, maybe I've matured or calmed down, who knows? <laughs> but I realized that to make uh, change, we need data points. And so this is my start. So just some background. Um, 14% of the BC population lives rural, and there's definitely a lack of research um, around BC rural eMERGE departments, especially when it comes to resource allocation and uh, patient outcomes. But we know from rural Canadian research that rural residents have a lower life expectancy, higher in-hospital mortality rates following stroke, just a recent study, and definitely greater risk of trauma and trauma-related death. Um, and we also know that most rural eMERGE departments in BC have limited resources. You know, most have a lab, x-ray, and if you're lucky, a formal ultrasound, but a CT scan is definitely a luxury. Um, there's a, you know, there's a handful of, of rural communities that have CT scans, and most of those communities are, have a population over 10,000. Nelson, Dawson Creek, Terrace, um, and we know CT scans are important and you know, we know that they you know, are helpful for diagnosing and triaging life-threatening illnesses. So I had two questions. I wanted to look at our transfers and figure out how many are, of our transfers are, are for CT scans. And I also wanted to, to um, calculate how many of these transfers could have been avoided if we had a local CT scan. And then number two, um, I wanted to know how long it takes our patients from Golden to get uh, emergent CT scans. So this is Golden. Um, we see almost 9,000 patients per year in the eMERGE. We have a lab, x-ray, <clears throat> and formal ultrasound. Our closest CT scan is 244K away, and that's in Cranbrook. And our closest trauma center is uh, in Calgary, which is 325 kilometers away, which has become a bit of a block recently. So um, our actual you know, trauma center down the road is most likely gonna be Kelowna, which is you know, even further. So from 2017 to 2018 in that year, every single transfer from Golden was tracked. Um, either by the most responsible nurse, the physician, or the unit clerk. And the key info that we tracked was reason for transfer, CT request time, CT time, CT results. And each transfer was reviewed by a team to determine if the transfer could have been avoided. We divided all these patients up into triage levels, and the triage levels were based on BCPTN's color-coded triage levels to prioritize patient transfers. So it's nothing new. We all know who, who the physician, the physicians on the line will know about this when they phone PTN. So red is previously life or limb, but now emergent life sensitive, yellow, urgent time sensitive and green, non-urgent. So we in Golden transferred 220 patients um, to receiving hospitals. That's about you know four transfers per week. 
61% of those were for CT scans and 38% of total transfers could have been avoided with a local CT scanner. Question two, how long does it take our patients to get emergent CT scans? This was the time that the rural physician ordered a transfer for a CT scan to the time that the CT scan was read and interpreted by the radiologist at the receiving center. And you'll notice again, red being you know, life or limb time sensitive, the average time was close to seven hours, which is you know, pretty, pretty significant. For urgent, um, even longer, non-urgent, you know, up to 16 hours average. Um, and I took a subset of acute strokes, hot strokes, and um, that was you know, close to five hours. So looking at the research, we, we believe that this is the first study to track transport time intervals in rural BC. As I mentioned before, 61% of these transfers were for CT scans. Um, and, and we felt that the time delays to CT were very long, almost seven hours for time sensitive emergencies. Most of these were multi-trauma, um, some were query, you know, subarachnoid hemorrhage, aortic dissection, um, and the rest were altered level of consciousness. And definitely the potential for negative consequences exist. You know, waiting for seven hours for an emergent life or limb CT scan. Um, and Gomez um, and his group showed that, you know, the risk of trauma death was three times more to the rural population versus urban. And then looking at hot strokes, which were a subset of the red, you know, almost five hours. And we all know, you know, time is brain when it comes to stroke. And the majority, um, if not all of them, of our stroke patients were outside of the therapeutic window. These transfers, you know, are in, especially out of Golden in a mountainous community are dangerous. Um, they're long, inconvenient to patients and families and a, a huge cost and burden on the system and to patients. So what are the next step solutions? Um, every rural community and town will have a different solution because it's you know, unique in geography and, and transport resources. But the hope of the study was to shed some light on the time intervals that it takes uh, you know, rural eMERGE patients to get emergent CTs. Um, and I hope uh, health policy makers realize that these time intervals, especially for remote locations, are inappropriately long in certain cases. The limitations definitely, um, you know, huge limitation was that it's a one year snapshot and it's a single rural hospital. Um, and I just wanted to, to um, emphasize that the scope of the study wasn't doing a cost analysis of inst installing a scanner. And it's really difficult um, rurally to compare patient outcomes um, based on transfer distances. So I just wanted to thank uh, RCCBC. Um, this was a, a grant research project, so I'm really thankful for that. Um, as well, I wanted to thank Jason. He's been sort of paramount in progressing this research and, and helping me along as I'm not a researcher, I'm, I'm a rural physician. So he's uh, definitely led me along the course. And I'm really thankful for that. And that's my family. That's, that's awesome. Thank you very much. So there, there was a question in the chat box and I've got a, another question for you. That was just a wonderful um, presentation. I love the family picture. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so one of the uh, participants uh, was asking, how did you define rural and, and did you draw on any of the definitions? If so, what? So yeah, that's a really good question question. Um, based on most of the rural eMERGE research that, that we looked at, um, a lot of the papers were, were by Dr. Fleet, um, Richard Fleet, who is an eMERGE doc in Nelson and now in, in Quebec. Um, and I mean, it's hard to define rural. Everyone has a different uh, definition. But in, in our study, 
we, we looked at rural being uh, under, you know, 10,000 population um, and or um, I forget the exact number, but I, I believe it's like 400 kilometers away from an urban center. I'd have to look at the, my paper. I don't have it written down here. That's okay. But I mean, there's a variety of def different definitions. Yeah, thank you. And just don't know if you've been able to see the chat come up, but there's lots mm -hmm. of congratulations and just really excited about this research um, and its potential for um, impacting the health system. Um, I have a question for you in terms of physician doing research uh, overall. Um, what was that experience like and how do you think you'll take this uh, experience and, and move forward with it in your own practice? Uh, yeah. <laughs> It was definitely off the side of my desk. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I'm busy because of work, but also my family. So it was, it was difficult sort of juggling and it was really helpful, as I mentioned, having Jason and, and a team to um, email and say, hey, you haven't been working very hard on this right now. We need to get going. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was difficult, but it, it was rewarding and, um, and I actually have another research project on the go as well. So it's, um, it's exciting and it's, uh, I think, meaningful work and I'm happy to be a part of it. Awesome. And then just one other quick, uh, oh, one, I'll ask one more quick question. Then we get one more for the, from the audience. Um, so what would you, um, uh, what kind of advice would you have for other physicians that are, haven't done this before the way you have? Um, what kind of advice would you give them? Um, oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, in terms of a topic, pick something that frustrates you <laughs> and uh, use that energy to, to, you know, get into research. And then in terms of initially, I just started on this on my own and, um, it was really difficult. And I would say you definitely need some help, um, get some friends on your side who know how to put together a manuscript and, 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 how to juggle research who have experience. Definitely try not to do it alone. Got it, yeah. No, it, it definitely is a team sport, not, a, not an individual one. Um, so I know there's a question from Dr. Kaylee Wu. Uh, Jason, I saw that, but I can't see the question. Would you mind just um, asking the question for me? You're on mute, Jason. Yeah, I can certainly do that. Thanks, Dee. Thank uh, it was, uh, Adam, it was um, concerning, I uh, just going back here, I think it was, um, what are the average wait times for non-rural environments? And uh, I think you know that from some of the literature reviews that you've done, but I think, I don't know if it's, you got an answer for that one. The, sorry, for non-rural, like for urban, yeah. the wait times for urban. I yeah. don't actually have that. Um, I, I don't have the answer to that. Um, that's something that we wanted to, to find, but it was just so varied depending on the department uh, and the eMERGE, but definitely not seven hours. But no, that's a good point, and um, we need to do sort of further research on that. Awesome. Well, we're right at time now. Um, that was an absolutely wonderful way to kick us off. Um, really appreciate you uh, coming in, Dr. Watchcorn, and, and uh, really excited to see how this uh, study changes, influences things moving ahead. So have a fantastic day. And um, I'm really pleased to start with the next presentation from Dr. Hale. Uh, and Jason, you're gonna go ahead and um, Bring that up. Yeah, I'll certainly do that. Um, just bear with me. So Dr. Hale uh, wasn't able to be here today, so but she did send a, um, a her presentation um, in video format. So I'm going to go ahead and share that presentation. Uh, and then in terms of question and answer, um, a colleague of Dr. Hale's is uh, presenting immediately after. Uh, and she'll be able to um, answer the questions uh, thereupon. I'm just going to stop. I just need to optimize the video. So bear with me one more sec.
On average, as we all know, health outcomes for people in rural areas are worse than for those in urban centres. But there are some exceptions to this rule. This map shows areas of Canada coloured by their health outcomes. Orange is unhealthy, green is healthy. You notice most of the dark green areas are around big cities and that the rural areas tend to be rather orange. But you also notice where the arrow is, a healthy green patch in rural southeastern BC. So we decided to talk to key informants in one of the communities in this healthy outlier region to find out what more about what might be contributing to this good health. Our focus was on community-based as opposed to facility-based health. Um, and we also wanted to know more about how things might be better and if there were any ideas that could be shared with other communities. We used a qualitative methodology guided by the socio-ecological model of health. And we identified a number of key themes, the first of which, mentioned by almost every respondent, was uh, the abundance of local recreational amenities and facilities and the natural environment that, that facilitated um, physical activity. For many people, this was the thing they felt influenced health most, and also was the thing that they thought attracted most people to live or visit the community. Another theme that came out was that health and healthy lifestyle were highly valued by people of the town. Some described it as a vibe or the culture of the town that was very activity oriented. It even extends to the official community branding as you see from the billboards here. Others talked about the positive feedback loop that results from a large proportion of the community sharing the belief in the importance of health. Another theme was related to the change in the community since the mine closed approximately 20 years ago. It created sort of an interesting built-in control as many of the respondents were around both before and after the mine closure. The transition to a tourism economy has largely been felt seen as a positive one for health. The last theme emphasized the importance of the town's location. Not being on a major highway reduces the number of transient people who arrive and reduces the need for fast food restaurants. Its proximity to a mid-sized centre allows residents to work and shop in the city but live and play in the smaller town, retaining a quiet, slower-paced atmosphere. Social service supports are also located in larger communities, so people who require these supports tend to locate there. This, as one participant put it, makes our healthy average go up. Traditionally, this area was not a major centre for Indigenous people. It's located where it is because of the mine, not because the rivers join here, so the Indigenous population is relatively low. Of course, there were several challenges that were mentioned that negatively impact the health of some of the members of the community, such as transportation, winter weather, uh, wage disparity, food insecurity, and um, the constant threat of unsustainable growth. So our key take-home messages were primarily, um, first of all, rural does not have to mean unhealthy. Uh, many people uh, are actually moving from urban areas to communities like this one, specifically for health region. reason. It's a phenomenon called amenity migration, more recently dubbed COVID migration. It's fueled by rising real estate prices in urban areas, the stress of the urban rat race the increasing feasibility of remote work, and a growing recognition of the importance of proximity to natural spaces. But uncontrolled migration can lead to unhealthy impacts on residents, the environment, and the culture of rural towns. Another take-home message was that, although we used the socio-ecological model to guide our questions, what emerged was more of a pattern of responses that flipped the model on its head. Respondents suggested that in this community, it was the mindset of the individuals that was the main driver of health, and it was individuals who influenced friends, families, visitors, and drove the development of health-related organizations, infrastructure, business, public policies, and the overall culture in the community. You can plan and build facilities, but as has been seen elsewhere, even if you build it, they won't necessarily come unless the health-oriented mindset is there to begin with. And the final take-home message was that despite wages being higher during the mining era, the population was reported to be less healthy at that time, which is counter to our usual understanding of the relationship between health and wealth. 
Despite higher level of support for recreational infrastructure and programs from the mining company and the municipality during the mining days, at least as many or more programs and facilities are available now through the efforts of highly motivated volunteers and nonprofit organizations. This phenomenon has been described in other resource extraction communities where the mindset is more about taking from the land and with less of a sense of connection to place and community. Combined with the higher rates of substance abuse, domestic violence, and mental health issues reported amongst workers, particularly in remote or isolated uh, or fly in fly out communities. So, of course, there were some limitations to this study. It was very small, it was only focused on one community. The sample was only uh, 12 respondents, and there were no um, uh, participants who were members of vulnerable groups, although we did aim to um, select representatives of those groups and uh, as with all qualitative research the um, we're getting the qualitative side of the uh, the story and not the quantitative so our next steps and we've already started this Madeline uh, one of the students will be presenting um, uh, a similar study that was conducted in a, a nearby community we want to compare the qualitative data that we have with actual quantitative health outcome data and ultimately, we'd like to try to uh, develop a better understanding of how uh, to gauge the health of communities that doesn't rely on uh, simply you know, population size or you know, um, um, sort of economic data, um, so that we can more fairly allocate health resources to communities who need them most. Thank you for listening, and I also want to thank our community partner, Healthy Kimberly, and our funders at the RCCDC. Wow, that was uh, amazing. Um, uh, of course, Dr. Alona Hale, as you probably ascertained, lives uh, is lives in Kimberley, BC, and um, her discussion was around making what, what makes um, a healthy rural uh, a healthy rural community. Uh, and now we've got the next time twister from Madeline Burnett, who is her colleague, uh, about uh, what makes a rural community healthy. Um, and so we'll save those questions for both these presentations to the end of uh, when Madeline presents. Madeline, welcome. Just introduce yourself and and uh, and your presentation. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, I'm Madeline. I'm one of the medical students at UBC, and I work with with Dr. Hale. Um, and I'm gonna tell you now about phase two of that, what makes a rural community healthy project. Um, so we'll jump right into it. Just to kind of briefly flesh out a little bit more background. Um, we, we know from traditional health research that there's a rural penalty in terms of health outcomes. So um, there's a lot of research on that, but not a lot of research focuses on kind of the positives of rural health and what, what helps promote health in rural communities. And so we were interested in fleshing that out. Um, through phase one, we realized there's no real definitions of a healthy community. It's more, um, we tend to focus on healthy individuals. So um, we wanna kind of continue this project in a number of different communities to help us understand that. And so, Today, I'm gonna to be telling you about um, Sparwood, which is another community in the East Kootenays, that region that she was pointing out um, on that map. Um, but it has different, different influences on health. So um, in Sparwood, there's five coal mines. They're all operated by the same company. Um, it's down kind of in the east, Eastern corner of BC, um, really close to the Alberta border actually. It's got actually a higher average income than, than the BC provincial average, but fewer post-secondary degrees. Um, so that's just a little bit of the social history in Sparwood. So um, just our methods, we did 10 key informant interviews with community leaders in Sparwood, and we really based our, our interview guide off of this socio-ecological model of health. So. Um, we tried to get each participant to address each of these different levels of, of organization within the community. So in Sparwood, our first main theme was tech coal. So that's the, 
the main employer in the area. Um, and our participants reported some positives about tech. So like lots of employment opportunities for people from all different kinds of backgrounds and lots of community engagement in terms of like support for healthy living for the employees, um, lots of support for different community events and programming um, and within the schools as well. On the flip side, we heard that there's some, some negatives to tech in terms of health. Um, there's a lot of economic inequity in Sparwood and that the people who work for tech do quite well, but the people who don't work for tech, there isn't many jobs for them. Um, and that can be a bit of a problem. There's also this culture of mining at tech. And so people kind of talked about the um, destruction of the land in terms of mining also translates kind of into sometimes a disregard for the environment. Um, and that can be a problem that everybody's trying to work on shifting. There's also some problems in terms of like shift work and stress within the community. And then also coal dust creates a lot of problems for people's health and that sometimes it even rains like a black color in Sparwood. So um, that was what we found out about tech. Our next main theme was about the culture in Sparwood. And we heard from a lot of participants that there's a really strong sense of family and that it's very multi-generational in terms of activities that people do. So um, this quote here in the green box kind of highlights things that people do as a full family. Um, on the other side of that, we also heard that there can be a cultural issue of transient population where people come for their four days of work and then leave. Um, so they're kind of residents of Sparwood, but they're not fully community members and that can really influence the culture. Our third theme was about recreation. Um, and this kind of mirrors what Dr. Hale was talking about in Kimberly. There's a lot of focus on active recreation in Sparwood. They have this really big community facility that's in the picture here um, that um, is really accessible to everybody in the population. And um, that's really a positive thing for all age groups. Um, we also heard about this strong tie to the land in terms of hunting and fishing, and that kind of counteracts um, what I was saying about tech in terms of environmental considerations by people. And people reported like a lot of positive experiences with um, hunting and fishing and spending time outside them in that way. Our fourth theme was about children and youth. And we heard that this is like a really well supported age group in, in Sparwood. Um, there's a lot of healthy living in the school, like being outside, healthy eating. Um, and they really have a lot of programming for youth, especially for teenagers that um, kind of helps keep them busy after school. Um, we did hear that there's a child care crisis in Sparwood, which is not exactly unique to Sparwood. So um, lots of problems with finding people to look after kids and that can keep parents out of the workforce. And then our final theme was about the location and the climate of Sparwood. Um, we heard that it's hard to get outside sometimes because of smoke in the summer and then ice and snow in the winter. And then also the location of Sparwood in terms of like different amenities available are not located necessarily in Sparwood itself. So people drive a lot and there's a bit of a culture of driving that um, people said kind of harms the health of, of community members. So overall in Sparwood, we saw some features that are consistent with that kind of single industry town um, that we know from the literature can promote an unhealthy lifestyle, but there were some positives in Sparwood, like um, the easy access to recreation, strong ties to the land, good youth programming that we think um, could be replicated elsewhere. Um, our participants told us kind of what, what they wanted to see for future changes in Sparwood. One of them's promoting a diversified economy so that tech is not the only employer um, and working on kind of like a recreation-based economy. And then um, other than that, like making sure facilities are accessible, especially in the winter and working on the childcare crisis. So I just wanna thank everyone for listening and especially thank RCCBC for 
for our funding. We're also a grant project. Um, and I can take any questions there are for this project or for Ilona's project. Wonderful. Thank you, Madeline. That was incredible. Um, just from the chat box, somebody commented that they really love your strength based approach. And I, I would agree. Um, you're building upon what's there and what you can spend, expand upon versus sort of the gap. Can you just maybe comment a little bit about how that approach was for this research? Yeah, yeah, that was part of the reason I wanted to join this project is that strength and it all came about because of that map that Ilona showed where the East Kootenays um, are a rural area but actually have pretty high indices of health. Um, and those of us who like kind of live and work in the East Kootenays have an idea of why that is, but I, we wanted to share that with the world and that's kind of how that how that happened. That's fantastic. And I'm sorry, I missed uh, just at the front, you are a medical student, right? I am, yeah, I'm a third year. That's fantastic. So I'm just curious again, same sort of question about what was, how did this do, doing research for you, what was that experience like? Um, and how do you think it'll affect your practice moving ahead? Yeah, good question. Um, we, we do a project as part of medical school. So that's how I got started with this. And really, I just wanted to go and be at home and um, have part of medical school at home is how I got got into this project. But I think it's really important to answer questions about the places we live in. And hopefully, I'll be able to continue to do that through my practice. That's, that's fantastic. Great answer. And then somebody um, Dylan Dunsmer Farley sounds like he's got some research that's really, uh, you know, that having a copy of this research would be helpful. Um, has this been published anywhere yet? Good question. The Kimberly research has been published. Um, the Sparwood research where kind of I've actually collected data in a couple of other communities and it's just not quite ready for, for presentation yet. So when it's all finished, it'll be published. Um, but the Kimberly paper is available. I think it's called What Makes a Rural Community Healthy. Awesome, thank you very much. And Jason, just a quick question for you. Um, for anybody that wants uh, in the audience a copy of the presentation slides, are those available? The, uh, pre again, the presentations will be all recorded so the, the presentations will be uh, uh, provided on the website. And then um, uh, we, we will, if, if you want the physical copy, we can, we can coordinate that through, uh, through the presenter as well. Wonderful, so just, just get a hold of the main RCCBC email. You'll see it on the web page if you just Google RCCBC, so we can help you out. So Madeline, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We'll pass our thanks on to um, Ilona, Dr. Hale as well, and uh, have a really fantastic day. Um, and we'll move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, so our next presenter is Dr. Tandy Wilkinson, and uh, she's got her presentation, It Kept Me Working as a Doctor, Physicians and Informal Peer, Peer Support. So over to you. Good morning. Just going to get my screen up here. So my name is Tandy Wilkinson. I'm a rural physician from Nelson, BC. And I would just like to start by saying this research was supported by a rural scholar grant, which was invaluable, and also a research grant from RCC. And so I'm, I'm going to talk about peer support. <laughs> um, so this is Sticky Oden. It's a mountain outside of the village of Hazelton, which is where I did my first, um, my first job as a newly trained physician. And, the uh, other name for Sticky Odin is one who stands alone, which I think is a great metaphor for what it feels like to start working in rural practice. So um, it's well known that um, our job exposes us to emotionally difficult events, although it may not be well known to us when we start working, but you know, things like medical error and malpractice lawsuits and vicarious trauma um, are, are clearly very troubling things, but there's also a number of things that are more common kind of in day-to-day -day work that can also do that. Things like unexpected patient deaths and, and illness. And the literature tells us that at these times, uh, physicians desire peer support. 
but our culture really is a barrier to us accessing that. There's, uh, you know, a conspiracy of silence around um, things in medicine. There's certain things we do not want to talk about. There's a kind of a culture of blame. Something bad happened, therefore you did something wrong. And there's a tendency to ignore our own emotional distress. So there's lots of reasons why peer support doesn't happen. So I really wanted to look at the gaps in peer support and, and the huge gap actually, um, almost a, a, a chasm, almost a Grand Canyon sized gap is there's really very little research on informal peer support. So there's, you know, there's a move towards developing these formal systems of support, which are much less available rurally, but no one's really talking about what's just happening naturally, you know, in the background that is maybe helpful. I really couldn't find any work on that. So that's what this study is about. So this is a qualitative research study. Uh, 11 rural physicians um, were interviewed for one hour each. And the qualifying um, criteria was that they had to have had uh, what they felt was a meaningful experience of uh, informal peer support. And so informal means outside of any formal support system. This is something that, that ha happened uh, outside from that. And the methodology was um, hermeneutic phenomenology, uh, which I, I find an absolutely fascinating um, perspective. So phenomenology is the study of lived experience. And in this case, we're saying, what does the study, studying the lived experience of these physicians tell us about peer support? And then hermeneutics says that the research team cannot be unbiased. They come with all their pre-existing um, beliefs and experiences. And, and that actually that's a contribution to the study, not a, not a problem. And so the, the data interpretation is a fusion of the participants' lived experience and the research team's experience. And the theory is that this deepens our understanding of what we're studying. And I certainly found that to be true in this case. So uh, the summary really, I think, is that uh, peer support helps physicians see that they are not alone. But obviously there's much more to it than that. So physicians were asked to describe uh, the value of the peer support they received and just peer support in general. And, and they said um, these sorts of things, critically important, completely vital, and life-saving. And actually most of the participants felt was essential to their career. Almost all of them said if they hadn't had the single incident of peer support that they were talking about in the study that they wouldn't have continued to practice in medicine and most especially in rural medicine. So this is not an insignificant phenomenon and it's you know, really shocking that we're not have, have more aware of, awareness of this as, as rural physicians. So here were some other things that they said. So one person said, I had more compassion. So this is a young man who hadn't really had, you know, any health problems and suddenly he, you know, had an episode that required peer support and he felt he had way more compassion for what his patients were going through. A number of people said they had more of an ability to ask for help which is a pretty important ability if you are on your own. Um, if you have barriers to that, it's not gonna go well for you. Um, many people said it deepened their relationships, uh, not just with their patients, but also with the peers. So with the, the peer supporter and just colleagues in general. People had an improved sense of self-worth. They didn't come away from the peer support uh, thinking that they were perfect, but they, they came to see that actually they were good enough. It wasn't about being perfect, but it was that they were adequate for the job, which was a, a huge uh, transition for them. Um, people felt they had the strength and resolve to do something that you know they needed to do that was maybe difficult. Um, there was definitely um, improvement in recruitment and retention long-term uh, retention, both in, in medicine and in rural medicine. And then um, people felt that they actually gave medical, better medical care. They, I think they were just more present to the experience of what was going on in front of them rather than the, oh my God, the what if, you know, kind of not the things that can happen in our head. 
So the um, couple of themes that arose from this work was um, that the duration of the peer support was not uh, um, important. So we might think that, oh, for me to like provide peer support, God, you know, I've got to book off three hours in my schedule and actually no. So this person, it was a seminal moment in my career and in my life. Uh, that was a five minute conversation that she had with somebody that resulted in her having that experience. Uh, somebody um, had a one sentence text that absolutely changed the trajectory of his whole experience. So duration, um, the time put in to providing peer support does not equal the value that comes out the other end. It really um, uh, takes on a life of its own in terms of, of the magnification there. So peer support mostly rose because the peer actually reached out. So they may have just been asking, how are you? Because they were genuinely interested or often they were uh, aware that there was something going on because they were proximity, you know, they were um, on the shared ward of the hospital or walking by the emergency department or a shared office space. And they often saw someone's distress and, and reached out for that reason. That was the main way people access peer support. Um, some actually reached out for peer support. That wasn't as much as common, but it seems like if people had had a good encounter with peer support, they were actually more likely to reach out to ask for it down the road. And they were more also likely to reach out and, and offer it to other people. Um, you know, I've called this the, the, the value of the senior colleague, um, which isn't quite true, but it's colleagues that, um, so first of all, colleagues shared with, with their own experiences, which was super valuable. So they were able to say, well, you're not alone in this, you know, this has also happened to me. And, you know, not everybody in this town likes me either. And people saw that, uh, oh, geez, my colleague has also been through this and, and they've survived. And so I can too. But what was essential is um, the ability to put, uh, as a peer supporter, you have to put your own emotions aside. So one person had had some support from new grad, other new grads, um, she was talking to them and they were so horrified that this could happen to them too, that they were not actually able to provide that support. So this is some, um, uh, some of the components of the peer support that were described as useful. So number one was not non-judgmental. People actually couldn't believe it when they were able to say what went on and, and they did not, uh, you know, they were not blamed. They were just supported by their colleagues. Uh, one person said, you know, they saw it through my eyes. So part of being a peer supporter is uh, it doesn't really matter I mean, it is sort of what you think about the case and, and the medicine, but you kind of want to suspend that and just uh, try to understand what the other person was experiencing. And so Dr. People, sorry, right? Dr. Wilkinson, we've got about a minute left and this is an absolutely amazing presentation. So I don't want to cut you off short. Just want to let you know. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I, yeah. Um, and all these other things that you can see, <laughs> listening, validating, normalizing, reframing. So I just, I just want to leave you with um, the thought that um, it, informal peer support uh, could change the trajectory of your life, both as someone who receives it and someone who gives it, and many other people's lives would be touched by that as well. And it really comes down to um, um, changing our medical culture by asking one question at a time. So really just asking people, how are you? So first of all, so we don't have time for questions and I know um, there has been quite a few comments around positive, um, just, just in regards to what a powerful presentation. And I just want to give you a shout out because um, I actually have done hermeneutic phen phenomenological research and that is no easy, <laughs> easy method, method and uh, d just wow. Um, and how, what wonderful, rich um, results that you have found and incredibly powerful. So um, my hands up to you because that was not just an incredible uh, presentation with some really powerful findings, but uh, the methodology you, you chose, I have to take my hat off to you. So uh, to you and your, your team. So I know we do have questions. We will send them to you, Dr. Wilkinson. Thank you so much for your time today and for the powerful presentation. Um, and just 
have a great rest of your day and hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so moving uh, along, um, we've actually got uh, Dr. Denise Jarowski next. Is this correct, Jason, or are we going to Dr. Sparrow? Are we switching things around? Sorry, it's, it's, it's uh, Dr. Jarowski, yes. Wonderful. All right, Dr. Jarowski, it's, you're up. Just introduce yourself in your presentation. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Denise Jaworski and I identify as a settler physician uh, up in Terrace in Northwestern BC on the unceded territories of the Simshian people. I'd like to thank the uh, BC Rural Health Research Exchange for the opportunity to present this work today, um, which is part of my ongoing and never ending, it seems, PhD. And this is on a paper called The Influence of the De Definition of Rurality on Geographic Differences in HIV Outcomes in BC. Um, uh, in addition to the territory of the Simpson people, I would like to thank all of the people living with HIV who were participants in this study. I'd like to thank the CIHR for fellowship funding and also my co-authors and thesis committee. So as we've already heard um, throughout this morning, there are a lot of challenges when we define rurality. There are many different definitions. There's no one uniformly uh, accepted definition and there's variability across studies, which makes them hard to compare. I was looking at some studies done in Ontario using the same data set by uh, similar uh, researchers, um, overlapping members of study teams, and they actually use different definitions of rurality in their uh, different analyses. And then the other thing is that rural is a subjective term and it means different things to different people. I grew up in Toronto and I now live in Terrace. I consider myself to be living in a rural community, but someone that's living in Dees Lake or Gitsagukla might consider Terrace to be the big city. So when we think about the interaction between rurality and health, we know it's very complex and it's mediated by many factors, factors related to access to care, but also other determinants of health like colonialism, racism, poverty, and many of these factors interact with each other. So it's a very complex relationship between rurality and health. So with that in mind, the objective of this project was to explore how the definition of rural can actually influence the results you get when you run a rural health outcome analysis. And I used HIV viral load suppression as an example. So in this analysis, I uh, did a couple of different um, analyses using different definitions of rural to see how that impacted uh, health, uh, the health outcome of HIV viral load suppression. And so I defined rural or geographic differences in several ways. First, by forward sortation address, or sorry, forward sortation area. And that's where if you take the first three characters of the postal code, if the second character is a zero, that's considered rural. If it's anything else that's considered non-rural. I also looked at things by the statistical area classification, which uh, is a, um, uh, a classification system set up by Statistics Canada, and there are seven categories that sort of go from most urban to most rural. Um, and uh, I also, uh, so I looked at each of those seven categories on their own, and then I also clumped all of the categories except major um, metropolitan areas together to create a non-urban um, versus an urban analysis uh, in a binary way. And the statistical method that I used and I'm presenting is just univariate logistic regression analysis. I did do some multivariable models, um, but I uh, chose to present the univariate analysis because I think that that's more appropriate. And I'm happy to talk later or offline about um, adjusted versus unadjusted analyses for rural health. And so this is just a map that shows how I defined the different rural areas. So if you look at map number one, this is using forward sortation area. So anywhere that the um, postal code second digit is a zero, you see in green, anywhere that it's non-zero, you see in red. Um, and that's how I split rural and urban for that analysis. In map number two, this is using the statistical area classification. And I, um, 
uh, considered all of the major metropolitan areas uh, to be urban and those you see in red and everything else to be rural and that's in green. And then I also looked at things by health authority and you can see the five different colors representing the different geographic health authorities. So here are the results um, from this analysis. So what you'll see is that if I looked at HIV viral load suppression by uh, rurality or non-rural using forward sortation area as the rural definition, there was no significantly statistical, uh, there's no statistically significant uh, impact of rurality on HIV outcomes. However, when defining rural by statistical area classification, you do see that rural areas were associated with lower rates of HIV viral load suppression. Interestingly, when you look at each individual category within statistical area classification, when you go from most urban to most rural, you do not see a linear effect where more rural uh, is associated with poorer uh, HIV outcomes, suggesting that the relationship is quite complex and not just a straight line uh, association. And finally, when looking by health authority, you'll see that the Northern Health Authority by far had the lowest rates uh, of HIV and was associated with the, the lowest rates of HIV. HIV viral load uh, suppression. And this was actually the strongest geographic predictor uh, compared to the rural, non-rural definitions. So then what I did is I went and I used GIS mapping and I mapped out by health service delivery area what the HIV viral load suppression rates were. And what you can see during this period is that the northern parts of the province uh, had much lower rates of viral load suppression compared to the southern areas. Uh, and that again corresponds with uh, the analysis by health authority as well. But this, uh, you'll see that the lower rates uh, expand beyond just the Northern Health um, Authority area. So in terms of key points from this, um, I would say that the um, that how you define rurality actually can uh, impact what outcome you get in your analysis. Another interesting finding was that north-south health disparities may actually be greater than the urban-rural uh, disparities, and this warrants further um, investigation. And finally, I would just like to um, advocate that if you are doing rural health research, you really need to be explicit about what you mean by rural and how you think that rurality influences health. Um, and so um, with that, I'd uh, just like to thank you all for listening. And I last minute changed my slides um, in, inspired by Dr. Wilkinson's last presentation. Uh, and this is a picture of uh, Stickyodin Mountain, which I see when I drive uh, to my visiting clinics in Hazleton. And I was going for lunch one day and uh, the mountain was just popping out above the clouds and I thought it was really beautiful. So I pulled over and took a picture and now I'm sharing this with you all today. Oh, fantastic. Um, so we we do have 30 seconds or so to, for, for a question, getting lots of wonderful feedback in the chat about your presentation, Dr. Gorowski. Um, maybe if you have just quickly, I'm, I'm wondering what the implications of your, um, your results that you've just reported out on policy, maybe. Do you have any just quick thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the main thing is that we need to be looking at north-south differences in addition to rural-urban uh, differences. And in Canada, uh, not just in BC, but across Canada, we need to be thinking about uh, how uh, northern geography also impacts health. Um, so that would be the main thing, I think. Wow, yeah, great, great point. Excellent um, um, presentation and really uh, looking like high quality research there. Really appreciate your time today. Um, we'll send you further questions that have come up. And, um, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Hope you continue to join us for some of the other presentations. Thank you. Take care. All right, it's my ple pre pleasure to now have Dr. Nicholas Sparrow uh, join us for his presentation. Dr. Sparrow, just introduce yourself and your presentation, please. Yeah, hi, Dr. Taylor. Thanks for having me. Hope everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Nick Sparrow. I'm a rural eMERGE doc working in Nelson, and I also am an uh, EMS physician. Uh, and so I'm presenting some data from Kerpa. You may have heard about Kerpa or you may not, but I'll go through it in the presentation. Um, Dr. Taylor, can, can you hear me okay? And I'm just sharing my screen now. Uh, so I'm hoping everyone's going to be able to see this. Uh, here we go. Uh, Sorry, it's asking me to open my system preference. 
So I've just got to click this and hopefully my screen will share. No worries, it'll pop up. Okay. Jason, I don't know if you want to get Tom to help if he, if he can. So it looks like I've done it. We'll see, here we go. Looks like we're ready. Can we see my screen? Great. Great. Is, that, is that working? Perfect. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So um, I'm gonna be presenting data on a quality improvement project to improve the care and utilization of Kerpa. And I'll explain what Kerpa is. Um, thank you for having me on this presentation for Rural uh, Coordination Centre of BC and thank you Dr. Taylor for hosting it. So what is Kerpa? Kerpa is, uh, stands for Kootenai Emergency Response Physicians Association. And it's actually a Canadian registered charity that sends a qualified ER EMS physician for free. We don't bill the government MSP uh, to life-threatening 911 calls. And our aim is quite simple. It's about saving lives helping critically ill and injured patients and supporting the emergency services. Uh, we have a BC EHS medical programs collaboration agreement in place. And actually this started, this program started back in 2009 on the Sunshine Coast where it was run for three years. And then um, when I moved to Nelson to work in the emergency department uh, worked, um, we, we restarted the pilot project Initially, it was self-funded. I basically paid for all equipment, kit. I was responding in my own personal vehicle. 2016, it became a non-profit, and 2018, we became a charity. This is how it all started on the Sunshine Coast. This is uh, my father-in-law's Oldsmobile I bought for one dollar. Uh, put these little uh, stickers on to say "Community Response Doctor." Someone said it looked like a pizza delivery car, and all of those little stickers flew off over the years. Uh, when I moved to Nelson, um, upgraded to a suburban because I have lots of children, so it kind of worked both ways. And in 2019, actually have a dedicated 911 emergency response vehicle. I think it's the first emergency response vehicle that um, an EMS physician is rolling in uh, in the province. I'm not sure whether Canada, but um, that's the vehicle. And so we looked at, um, this is our methodology uh, for looking at uh, a quality improvement of six years of data from May the 1st, 2014, when the program started in Nelson to April 20, 2020. Uh, and we used variables consistent with Tozinger. That's the uh, uh, kind of reference below, but it's a set uh, variables for documenting and reporting data specifically for physician staffed pre-hospital services or PEMS is another terminology. So we looked at fixed system variables, so the organization, operational capabilities, um, dispatch codes, mission types, and then process mapping, like what diagnostics and therapeutic procedures were being performed. So over those six years, it's just currently me responding. So when I'm not working, I'm on 24 seven in the community to respond to immediate threat to life 911 calls. And in that six year period, I responded to uh, 451 immediate threat to life calls. 88% of those I actually attended the scene and assisted the patient. And on roughly 10% of the calls, it was actually 12%, I was actually canceled en route. And that's, that's fairly consistent with other EMS models. Um, I arrived on scene before the ambulance in roughly one in five of all primary missions. This was a, a stabbing in Nelson. This was taken from the newspaper like CBC. So it's not, um, you know, like it's not any patient confidentiality in there. Um, it's not a competition who arrives first, but we're talking about immediate threat to life uh, calls. So actually being in a dedicated rapid response vehicle makes a huge difference. And that's from having responded in a vehicle with no lights and sirens going to seizing kids and cardiac arrest to then being a dedicated rapid response vehicle. And in order to do that, you have to fulfill a whole bunch of criteria, being on a week's driver course in uh, Alberta, etc. Um, and um, when we actually got the response vehicle, our arriving on first on scene uh, increased hugely. Um, so it was just an interesting, uh, an interesting factor to add because a lot of people say lights and sirens don't make a difference. So I'd actually argue they make a life-saving difference. 
The five most common primary missions uh, were unconscious, high mechanism traffic incidents, seizures, cardiac arrest, and overdose. Um, yeah, 10% of the calls are to cardiac arrest and actually one in 10 calls I go on, uh, the patient sadly will die as a result of their medical condition or trauma. These are the variables. So these are the things that I'm performing on scene. Obviously I'm responding to high immediate threat to life calls. So you can see one in 10 patients I'm putting an intraos intraosseous needle into. That's because a large percentage of those are cardiac arrest or critical trauma. You see one in 16 patients, I'm giving analgesia. I'm using a life pack on one in three patients. Finger thoracostomies, one in 66. Femoral splints, one in 100. This is just a little bugbear. I really don't enjoy the Thomas splint. I think there's much better splinting out there. And uh, just from in the field, putting on femoral splints, I use the CT EMS splint. You can put it on in a couple of minutes, whereas the Thomas splint takes a long time. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from pre-hospital care. Uh, in terms of like the modes of transport, I'm uh, transporting with one in four patients. I'm following one in five to the hospital um, and one, one, in, um, one in 25. I think actually that's not correct. Yeah, one in 25, I'm not actually uh, uh, transporting the patient. Like uh, I'm not required, so I'm just able to, to go home. But you can see I'm uh, transporting about 25% of the patients. So over the six years, I was dispatched 451 times, attending 398 calls. One in four primary missions, we were using advanced procedures. One in four, uh, we were transporting with the patient. Uh, and essentially, Kerpa provides an extra set of hands supporting patient care and transport for critically ill uh, and injured patients in the rural environments. I think the data proves that PEMS, so physician EMS support, can be effectively utilized by a rural EMS system. And is it worth it? Well, I think it is. And even if it's just one person that survives as a result of uh, responding, this is a guy called Des who survived a cardiac arrest having gone to the gym. You can read about his, paper, um, his incident in the newspaper. It wasn't me alone that helped save his life, but a lot of other people um, involved in that care. Uh, and that's the end of my presentation. I hope that wasn't too rushed and I'm happy to share the slides or can send them to you by email if you want to look at some of those data sets. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was uh, again, an, an incredible presentation, Dr. Sparrow. Um, we're actually going, we have about 30 seconds for a, a quick question. And I guess, you know, just relating to what you said, um, about is it worth it in your last slide? I guess um, one of the questions I would have is how would you see this in terms of training for other rural locations um, in, in other areas? From what you've learned in your research, how would this be um, implementable in other regions? Yeah, I mean, pre-hospital pre care, physician pre-hospital care response alongside EMS definitely can make a difference. You look at the European models, you look at even the US, they now have an MD1 program of physicians responding in rural areas. I know firsthand that it saves people's lives uh, because I've seen it. And even when it doesn't save people's lives, it changes the histories for the families. Uh, and personally, I think it's worth it. And this is being provided free as a charity uh, in the Kootenays. And I think it should be supported and embraced by uh, the province and federally across Canada is my opinion. And it's not replacing the ambulance service. There's always an ambulance, always a fire truck sent. Uh, it's an additional resource. Fantastic. And well, um, and you tied that up in a, in a bow um, in terms of the, um, the implications and the significance of your research. So thank you very much for your, for your time. We're going to move on to the next presenter who I understand also has um, some similar uh, themes into what you've just presented, Dr. Sparrow. So continue to join us if you can, and uh, really, really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks, Dr. Taylor. Take care. Um, so our next presenter is Jim Kyle, who's going to uh, speak about spatial insights into motor vehicle accidents within the regional district of the Central Kootenai. Welcome, uh, Jim. Can you just uh, introduce yourself and your uh, presentation briefly? Sure. Um, my name is Jim Kyle, and I recorded my presentation for various reasons, and you'll see my introduction right in, in that. So I'm going to share my screen. And 
hopefully. Hi, welcome to my presentation, Spatial Insights into Motor Vehicle Incidents in and around the Regional District of Central Kootenai. My name is Jim Kyle. I'm a Geographic Information Systems Professional, Firefighter, Search and Rescue Volunteer, and I'm being paid to do this research. So what is this research? It was for CURPA. It's grant funded. We have data agreements with the Regional District of Central Kootenai. No personal private data is utilized. Our objective is to find patterns in this data and answer the questions, why are people dying or getting injured? Where are people dying or getting injured? And what are the factors? The presentation data comes here from open data from ICBC and the government of British Columbia, and also includes data from the regional district of Central Kootenai. No other data was provided. The research methods our space-time cluster analysis, hotspot analysis, spatial correlation, utilizing tools such as ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Insights. Other research is available into motor vehicle incidents in a large amount from all sorts of organizations. They're listed here, but I don't have time to go over those in detail at this in this presentation. So where are motor vehicle incidents happening? The screen you see here is based on the ICBC open data. We're specifically looking mostly at casualties. So a casualty by ICBC definition is any time an injury that happens in an MVI is reported to them. So in here, you can see that Nelson had 534 casualties for Castle Guard 492 from 2015 to 2019. Of that, only 47% did ICBC have enough information to provide a latitude and longitude for the exact location of the collision. So if I look at Nelson, 61% were geolocated in Nelson. But if I look at Selmo, which is a little more rural, only 28% did they know the exact location of where those motor vehicle incidents are happening. So I want to narrow this down to just select the area that's in and around the Beasley Fire Department response area. So I'll select Beasley, South Slocan, and tag them. So at that level, you'll see that there's 51 casualty incidents. Only 43% were provided with latitude and longitude. And um, the various types of configurations uh, reported. You'll also notice that it's trending down for a while and then starts increasing. So this just shows that from ICBC open data that I uh, validated the data and this is showing they didn't provide the latitude and longitude. So continuing on, we have the regional district of Central Kootenai MVI data Um, all RDCK fire departments record callouts call to motor vehicle incidents in a centralized data management system. What you're going to see here is directly from that system. Here's a screen of all MVI incidents from, I will narrow that down to 2015 to 2019. As you can see, Terry's had 196 and Beasley 128. If I show Beasley, you'll see that um, correlates slightly to what ICBC had, as in a reduction in 2017, but a little bit over. If I continue on, the speed limits within our area vary from 80, 90 kilometers an hour to 100. In the Beasley area, which is right around here, it's 90 kilometers an hour. The average annual daily traffic volume as recorded by sites within the highways um, from Playmore Junction here is about 8,000 annual average per day and closer to Nelson it's 9,765. Uh, one of the highest parts in the West Kootenays. So the site Playmore Junction, you can look at the traffic volume a little bit more. You'll see that it's trend increasing and also the time 
uh, in the wee hours there isn't much traffic starting at about 6 a.m. it builds and it continually builds till about 800 vehicles are crossing a point per hour at uh, rush hour around 4 4 p.m. that means 400 cars passing per hour on each side of the road that's about one car every five seconds so where are the traffic fatalities happening as reported in public news reports these crosses represent where those are happening based on those highway sections and speeds the uh, regional district of central kootenai fire departments this is a heat map showing where the most motor vehicle incidents are happening that they're responding to and in there is from the beasley to the nelson area you can see those are hot spots compared to other areas um, here's a map showing where all the Beasley motor vehicle incidents are happening. In here, in this insight, this is basically when it's green, that's when it was either raining or snowing. And um, this is showing the hotspots for basically 2015-2019. If I click in December, when it was snowing, or raining on the road, you can see that a lot of hotspots are happening there. This is also showing um, high, low, and medium traffic volume and what, when that's happening and occurring and where those hotspots are on the highway. So, in conclusion, having accurate and reliable data for motor vehicle research is necessary to help determine causes. Traffic volume is increasing. The volume of collisions, the frequency of collisions, is directly proportional to the traffic volume and precipitation. What's next? If the locations of where motor vehicle incidents happen is predictable, can something be done to make fatalities and serious injuries at the locations preventable? Preventing fatalities and serious injuries on our roads benefits everyone at all levels. Is a Vision Zero initiative achievable? Is a comprehensive open database providing detailed crash information achievable? Let's talk about it. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. Well, um, Jim, first of all, when I'm, I, that dashboard is incredible. Um, it was really, really impressive. Um, so I guess my question, you know, as you were presenting, as I was looking at all that, that information and data, um, what come, came up for me is this concept of learning health system um, or the, the concept that uh, we use the data that we've got to um, give us information so that we can do some, some planning and, and do those PDSA cycles or the plan, do a C act kind of, kind of cycles. And this is to me what you've explained. So I think it's, it's quite brilliant. And, so the implications of this in your mind, maybe you could just speak, a, we've, got, uh, we've got actually about 20 seconds just in terms of the implications of this dashboard uh, around that planning and, and helping to prevent critical accident. That's, that's mainly the, uh, the point that you were making, correct? Did I get that correct? Yeah. yeah, that's correct. And so with that dashboard, we can see the hotspots on certain sections of the highway. So we know that those are um, critical points on the highway. And if it's made more known to a more wider audience, say um, the highway contractors, they may think about uh, adjusting how they maintain that highway in that area. And also the general public, if they know what's happening on those sections of the highway during high snowfall events, maybe they'll adjust their driving habits appropriately. And all that leads to um, the Vision Zero initiative, which um, just quickly, that's an initiative started in Sweden in, in the 90s to reduce traffic uh, injuries, serious injuries and fatalities down to zero. So that's their vision. And they've achieved a lot in the last few years, getting down to less than probably four per 100,000. And right now in our area, it's around, uh, it could be, from eight to 11 per 100,000, so yeah. Incredible, incredible, incredible um, information for sure. So thank you for joining us uh, today, um, Jim. Really appreciate your time and I hope you uh, stay, stay with us. And um, I know there'll be more questions, so we'll make sure we get them to you uh, afterwards, okay?
Great. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, moving along, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Lee. Dr. Lee, could you just introduce yourself and your presentation? Sure, thank you, Dr. Taylor, for that. So hi, everyone. So I just want to share my screen now. So I believe everyone see my screen for that. So good morning. And my name is Eric Lee, Associate Professor from the Faculty of Management at UBC Oklahoma campus. So today I just want to share with you our latest projects with my team is called the Internet Access is Not a Luxury, it's a Necessity. So rural communities speak about challenges and technology use during COVID-19. So I just want to take maybe 30 seconds to introduce our team for that. So we are we call ourselves WESET, which is stand for Rural Health Equity through Social Enterprise and Technology Synergies. So this is a multidisciplinary team of academics from nursing, medicine, social work and management, and also computers. So our objectives to building this team is to co-create a hub of research excellence that promote rural health and healthcare equity. And also we would like to partner with different rural communities to develop and implement what we call the rural-centric techno-social enterprise solutions to advance equity. So at the end of the day for that, so our reset team, which is, which is really want to emphasize that the equity landscape and also enhance health and health cares for rural disadvantaged population, including children and youth, indigenous peoples, and also the older adults in chronic disease for that. So we receive funding from the UBCO Eminence Grant and as well as the Regional um, you know, Social Economics Institute of Canada for that. So we would like to acknowledge their contribution. So our team, as I mentioned earlier for that, so we have representations from School of Nursing and also social work and from the Faculty of Management as well. Perhaps we have representations from Computer Science and also the Medical School and UBCO campus and UBC Vancouver campus. So when we talk about health disparities and rural populations, so 80% of the Canadians are living in the rural communities with that, but it's only served by 8% of the physicians. And then to provide the shortage from primary care to specialist care with significance in these regions. So mm -hmm. the, the populations have lacked access to the specialty cares. I think earlier today for that, we talked about this CT scan. And then, so I think this is one of the very examples for that. So we can really see the mm -hmm. kind of like the, the lack of like healthcare facilities and such as hospitals and necessary equipments, to, especially during the COVID-19. And then, so it makes the rural populations are in more disadvantaged positions for that. So we're also thinking about like the inadequate, like, in, in inadequate infrastructures to support health needs from transportation to high speed in internet for that. So thinking about like this breakdown and then so the high speed internet in the urban areas for that. So we have, we talk about like 97% penetrations, but when we go to the rural and also the indigenous communities drop down to 37% and also 24%. So it's, then it's really come to our COVID-19 survey. So in May, June, and early July, and this year's for that, our team conduct what we call a rapid survey. So really want to understand what challenge rural community members facing during COVID-19, and also how technology is being used during this time. So just be aware of that just like is kind of in the still in the first stage of the COVID-19 or first wave of COVID-19 for that, and then so. So in total, we collect almost like 300 responses. It's 70% of female is respondent. So you can see the distributions of the respondents, but that most of them are from the highest regions, but we also have representations from the Lofton Health and also the Vancouver Islands Health for that. And so here is a quick summary of the demographic information for that the majority of our participants is aged over 30, 60 or 50 plus for that. So many of them are Caucasians, but we do have age 24 individuals from the First Nations and Métis populations for that. So most of them have trade certificates or university degree. So, and then in the next few minutes, but I just want to share with some key examples with that. So 21.9% identify access to stable internet and connections is one of the top three priorities with that. So majority of them, they have access to the internet, but they also kind of realize that they have some, they use these to connect to their friend. And then more often than using these, 
because all we know that it's just not the face to face and interaction is limited. So and also we collected some information with that. And then so they use more often to use in kind of a technology to get information. So these are two kind of key findings in terms of the technology use. So when we talk about technologies access and also the computer use for that, so many of them have desktop and also smartphones, but they also really point out that this like device is not as good as the internet service. So that's one of the qualitative of that. And then so they realize that the importance of having stable and also reliable internet access is kind of crucial during the COVID-19. And also think about the number of devices for that. So while we talk about like work from home and also kind of learning from home, for that. So some families only have one device. Now they have to compete with the kids and the parents is kind of a struggle to, to get their work done. And so here is some kind of a challenge they also kind of mentions by our informants for that. So they're complaining about the infrastructures that have terrible internet access and no cell phone surfaces for that. And sometimes like internet snow or even a stop. And then so they have poor communications for that. But at the same time, we also find some positive experience with the technology, especially when they talk about like they cannot see their families face, face to face or visit their families that often. So being able to connect with families through the internet is very important. And soon family gathering for that, even in game life for that is found that they are not that isolated. So technology is also convenience in many ways for that, especially access to the healthcare without having to leave their house. So we all know they just like traveling to physicians or traveling to the specialties for that. Sometimes it's take hours or sometimes it's take days. So now with the technology for that, it's really open up the opportunity. So I just I want to kind of wrap up with a couple of like the comments with the telemedicines for that. So 30% of our participants identified that you know, health care service is one of the top three priorities for that. So it's good to see that is that many of them actually use the health care or the telemedicine service. So during the COVID, 19 for that and then so they and then one participant also comment that it's not the COVID actually so open up the health field of using the technologies in a way they might hesitant to use in the past so I think that would be some bright future when we talk about the technology and then also how to support rural health equity so in conclusion at this point, the internet access to it is, should be considered as a utility. It's not a luxury. It's one original code from our participant. So, and so we want to kind of really wrap that up with that. So when you can think about how we can build a better infrastructure to support the help and also the everyday lives of the rural residents is very important. So we do plan to kind of have a second wave of the research and compare different rural communities and also having some seasonal impact. And then we are entering the winter time time now for that, so what would be the differences in terms of the like, technology usage and also through the challenge. And also we would like to compare like, the telemedicine usage and also the user the experience with that. So thank you so much and then for having me today for that and I would like to take some questions and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, so we only have about a minute for, for questions, um, but th that again, another incredible presentation. And I can tell you, uh, living out here in Eagle Bay, which is uh, very rural, um, just recently getting better internet access has been, has been huge. But I'm wondering if you could comment a, a little bit more about one of your um, um, recommendations for further um, research that you had just listed there in terms of the different, doing some comparison uh, between different rural communities. I think this is an incredibly important point and wondering um, if you could just, you know, very quickly um, comment about why that's important. Well, I think it's one part for that. So when we talk about rural communities for that, so we use the standards mm -hmm. definitions for that, but some community have a little bit more resources or more advanced in technology use. I just I want to point out one community is actually doing quite good. It's Castle. So they have high speed internet access for that. I just want to kind of see if they just not, if some community have a better kind of internet access or technology support and compared to let's say the communities a little bit kind of like need some improvement in the infrastructure and how they impact their kind of like the health and equities in those communities for that. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the health and equities. I think that's very um, um, powerful. So just uh, quickly, we're out of time, but you are getting quite a quite a, a lot of um, questions. Um, so folks are wanting a um, copy of your paper, etc. So we're going to scoop back to Dr. Lee and just make sure that you get all that information. I know people uh, are curious about, do you have a map? 
um, et cetera. So um, lots of questions, and I'm sorry we don't have time for, for more, um, but be sure to know that we'll loop back to you and, and make sure that these folks get their, their questions answered. Absolutely. Um, again, just want to thank you so much for your time and just another powerful um, uh, presentation. And it's time to move on to our, our uh, next presenter. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thank you. Lee. Have a really good day. Thank you. All right. Take care. All right, and it is my pleasure now to introduce Christine Carthew. Christine, would you mind um, just introducing yourself and your presentation? Uh, sure, yes. Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Christine, um, and I work with uh, the Center for Rural Health Research, which is situated within UBC's Department of Family Practice. Can you all see my screen right now? Yes. Yes. And can you see my video? Because I can't see myself, which is kind of weirding me out, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, you're okay. So the, the uh, group can see your screen. Just go ahead and, and uh, carry on. Fantastic. Okay. So um, I would like to first uh, respectfully and gratefully acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, and before diving in, I'd also like to wish a warm uh, thank you to our partnering and funding organizations um, on the work that I'm going to talk about. And this includes the BC Rural Health Network, uh, the Rural Coordination Center of BC, who are of course hosting us today, and the BC Support Unit. Um, Quickly, learning objectives for today include to introduce um, a project called the Rural Evidence Review, uh, to share what um, our project has learned from rural communities about their experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic and how they have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and if we have time, propose a next step for this work. The Rural Evidence Review Project is a collaboration between the Rural Coordination Center of BC and the Center for Rural Health Research, where I'm located. Um, and we have funding under Canada's strategy for patient-oriented research to work in partnership with rural patients and rural communities uh, to provide high quality and useful evidence for rural health care planning. And we do this through three major activities. The first being that we ask rural patients and rural communities about their most important priorities for health care. Um, we then review and synthesize the international literature on these priorities. Um, and finally, we bring forward what we've learned um, to policy and decision makers in the province. Um, and also we return this evidence to the rural communities that we've engaged. So this project is a patient oriented research project, which means it's built on regular and reciprocal engagement with patients and communities across the province. And one key component of this uh, patient and community engagement work um, is our Rural Citizen Advisory Committee. So, so this is a, a, a group of, of rural patients from across British Columbia, um, and we come together quarterly um, to, um, to talk about the project and, and really the, the committee helps uh, the research team, supports the research team to understand and to action rural healthcare priorities through research. Uh, and this committee was actually instrumental in conceptualizing the survey study that I'm going to take a bit of a deeper dive into um, in just a second. It was during committee meetings in March of this year um, where members of the, of the committee uh, spoke about their community's early experiences of the pandemic, and they identified a gap in, in knowledge. And this gap was the experiences of other rural communities um, in how they were doing and how they were faring uh, during the pandemic, uh, with particular interest in stories of, of strength and, and innovation and resilience uh, in the face of the pandemic. So to respond to this knowledge gap, the Rural Evidence Review Project in partnership with the BC Rural Health Network launched a provincial survey, uh, an online survey, to learn from rural and remote patients and communities about their experiences of the pandemic and how they have been responding to the pandemic. And for those who might be unfamiliar, uh, the BC Rural Health Network is a network of rural healthcare advocates uh, across British Columbia, and they have a goal 
able to support and promote a healthcare system that is responsive and, and improves the health and well-being of rural patients and communities in British Columbia. This survey was shared to rural practice subsidiary agreement communities. So that's how we defined rural according to the RSA. Um, so it was shared to RSA communities through local newspapers and radio stations, uh, community specific Facebook groups and pages, local elected council and local chambers of commerce. And in total, we heard from 562 rural patients across 144 communities. Uh, and I will note that we heard from significantly more uh, female uh, respondents uh, and um, the median age of respondents was 57.5 years, which is higher than the, uh, the uh, median age of the province, which is uh, 42. So what did we find? Um, participants told us about um, physical, emotional, social, and financial impacts of the pandemic. Um, and this was both um, impacts in, in response to the threat of the virus, as well as in response to the uh, pandemic protocols that were put in place to mitigate against the virus. Um, and participants told us in, in great detail often about many activities and innovations at a local level that emerged to mitigate against the pandemic, um, to boost the spirit and to support the greatest risk uh, within their communities. So in the interest of time, wow, it goes by quickly. Um, I'm going to skip over going into more depth around the impacts of the pandemic. Um, but of course, I'm happy to talk about that with anyone at, a, at another time uh, or during the question and answer period. But I will just mention a couple of the responses that we heard about. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg. We heard about so many. Um, a couple included adopt a neighbor and senior watch programs. So these were put in place to check in and offer support to, to neighbors and, and those at risk within their communities. And these were offered uh, formally or informally. Um, we heard about vehicle parades to celebrate local birthdays and graduations and Easter and otherwise to just lift community spirits. Um, we heard about cheering and howling at set times to show appreciation for essential workers. And I know we had that in Vancouver as well, which is where I'm located. Um, we heard about local mask making initiatives, uh, pickup and delivery services popped up across rural and remote communities. Um, and this was offered through uh, grocery stores, pharmacies and other businesses, as well as through local volunteer groups. Um, and one more I'll talk about, we heard about expanded food bank services. So increased volunteering at, at the local food bank or other community food programs uh, and increased donations to these programs as, as well as other, other services. And very quickly, I might just end up just leaving this slide here so you can read it. Um, we hope to continue uh, and expand upon, upon this work and, and how that looks is um, yet to be fully determined. Uh, we're still um, working on that and a component of that is of course engaging with our uh, rural uh, citizen advisory committee about what they think is a, is a next step, uh, an appropriate next step for this work. But one um, option is to, or one idea that we're um, thinking about is to uh, develop ground up, uh, so community up markers of resilience in the context of pandemics and other emergencies, um, using this survey as a starting as a starting place for that. Thank you so much. Well done, Christine. And I know we're a little bit over time, but I'm going to give you an extra 30 seconds because there's lots of chat going on. Um, very quickly, which from your from your findings, what do you think is the really important to highlight as we continue to deal with this pandemic? Oh man, well, picking one thing I think feels impossible. <laughs> um, I do think the stories of, of strength and, and innovation, so how communities have responded is um, something that I, we've heard about for sure in, in, in some ways, like through local newspaper articles and whatnot, but I think it's, um, it is a knowledge gap. And, and I think it's something that uh, especially other rural communities can, can, can learn from. They can learn from one another around how, how different communities have, have responded and, and how they are coping, I suppose. So I think in terms of um, 
benefit to rural communities in BC. I think that information is especially important. Um, and one other thing I'll say, I know I'm super tight on time. Um, there was, in, in terms of the impacts of the pandemic, I think unsurprisingly, there was a lot of talk around mental health impacts and, um, and um, as, as well as um, kind of the all of a sudden increase in, in virtual care. Um, and I think sometimes sometimes together. So uh, we saw in a couple of communities an increase in mental health services being delivered um, over like using virtual platforms. And I think those two themes really came through prominently in the data. Excellent, excellent response, Christine. Well done. Um, thank you again for your time. Um, really appreciate it, excellent presentation. And I hope you stick with us for the rest of this morning and have a really good day. Thank you so much. All right. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Fierguski. I am sorry if I have mispronounced that. Can that's, you uh, that's why I get everyone to call me Dr. Mike. Okay, Dr. Mike, I can do. Uh, right. Could you please please introduce yourself and uh, and your presentation? Hi, my name is Mike Fierguski. I'm a rural doc here in Big White, BC. I've been interested in open health for a number of years. I uh, wanted to talk about an open source health platform that we have called uh, VEMR. It's all based on um, open source software, so it's free. The code can be downloaded by anyone. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a bit about our journey, how we got here. Um, it started in, uh, in 1990, I was down doing, a, I used to be a GP anesthetist in Inuvik, and I went to do an extra year training at UCLA. And I saw a program they had in the VA hospital, LA, called the Vista, which was an EHR, great functionality, an old style. You know, it came up, it was an organic production where doctors and programmers worked in the basements of these VA hospitals, which are largely left to their own devices, um, you know, due to lack of funding, and came up with a, a, a grassroots application that was wonderful for health. Uh, 10 years later, I was tapped on the shoulder to do pedo work in the South Okanagan and I became the rep and went into doctor's offices and convinced them to use an open, or convinced them to use one of the six proprietary EMRs. And two or three years later, I was making apologies because it really hadn't uh, delivered the promises I'd given uh, at the beginning. So I, I resigned from um, pedo and started a company for open source software development called VistaCan. We took Vista EHR, which had just been released under open source through Obama in 2011. So it was free for everyone to use. And the license for all the software we use is GPL. So you can't charge for it. You, anyone can use it as long as they attribute the origin. We've always been self-funded. Uh, this is Vista. And this was my mistake. Three years later and a whole bunch of money we had a great application that nobody could use because it wasn't adaptable. The code was mixed with the application and MUPS programmers are hard to come by. MUPS, by the way, was developed at John Hopkins specifically for medicine and ruled databases in the 80s, but has since fallen out of favor. For more modern architectures, including OpenEMR, and after looking everywhere, and considering, you know, that, that three years wasn't a waste because it taught me a lot about open source software, open source development, what to look for in a program and how to move quickly. Uh, one of the best talks I've ever seen was given by a man named Rick Marshall, who for 30 years did what we're doing now, trying to develop operability between sites for the VA with 6 million highly complicated medical records. And his paradigm was the golden pair. He said, if you put one doctor with one programmer and let them work closely together for a very long time, they can achieve a very good system for one doctor. But if you use that system, it can be applied more generally. It's a term now in engineering called glocalization, where you look at a local development and distribute it. Rather than the old model, which was to create a huge project and try to make it fit wherever you put it. 
So we adopted this platform, OpenEMR, which has a huge community base. It's used by millions of doctors in tens of thousands of clinics worldwide. And you can find active development in all areas. The paradigm we used, first I found a really good programmer. He's in India. His name is Sam Sudin. Um, all our services are hosted in AWS Montreal. We use virtual uh, machines, usually in containers. Amazon is machine instances which means you can spin up another EMR in a matter of minutes. Our database is well-defined. It's a MySQL database on the back end. So that means that because the schema, the way the tables are arranged are well-described, you can add another service that has nothing to do with your EMR. You can do a quick web app that pulls data, pushes data securely all within the AWS environment for very low price. Um, these are, that's the schema. And we've got, we're going to look at things from two ways. We're going to look at what the provider sees, something for the desktop, most for, mostly for office use, and something for the mobile. One of the goals was to create a, an EMR that you can use entirely on your phone. Uh, patient view, we've got a fully functional patient portal. The patient uh, registers online, gets, uh, uh, allows permissions to share uh, or to exchange information securely by SMS or email, and to use the a portal with its inherent risks. Uh, conceptually, uh, this is what our how our data looks. The uh, um, I also I wrote the white paper uh, chapter on data stewardship for best practices Canadian family physicians last year, and the doctor still owns the data, but the patient owns the right to the information fully and unencumbered. I think one thing I'd mentioned is if we change privacy laws to say machine readable, uh, it would change everything. Not only would doctors and companies and hospitals be obligated to share their patient with the data, it would actually be in a format they could use. Anyway, the health data is sorted in a MySQL database. So all of these other services can be integrated. We only use services that have Canadian servers and meet, meet HIPAA standards. Uh, of course, you can't be HIPAA compliant in Canada because we don't have HIPAA, but it would be if we were in the States. The physician side, they can browse through the EMR. So if, if uh, the, the EMR we use for demo is vemr.ca, I've been using the same application, the exact same programming code for my own EMR, which is uh, uh, bookmymd.ca. That's my EMR for office practice. Um, for a couple of years now. We also have a development site called cmamd.ca where Sam does all his development work and we can test it. The patient has access to an EMR. Uh, on the left side, you see the provider's view with the EMR. This is, it looks like a standard EMR. You can choose skins or presentation. You can totally redesign the interface if you like with uh, a fairly uh, standard tools. On the right side is an app we've developed with, uh, we can do video conferencing, send faxes to lab, uh, send faxes to, to pharmacy uh, from the patient's chart, uh, dictate using your, eye, using your own device and um, create an appointment and an encounter for the patient in the chart. From the patient side, uh, they get the portal view on the left side. They can create appointments. They can look at any documents. You can choose to share your notes or not. I usually don't unless they ask for it, in which case I download it as a single document. Um, and on the right side, you can see the various services that we've integrated for their, uh, for their use, including uh, text messagings to confirm an appointment. They get a, you know, for, if the receptionist creates a video appointment for a patient, they get a link to their confirmed, S, uh, their confirmed cell number. They click on the link and within the EMR, it's a video consult. Uh, there's a developer, bottom right, Sam's brilliant guy in India. He was getting here in Big White in January 2020 when uh, immigration stopped. So we're hoping to get him back here soon. Uh, we've added some extra features to the base EMR, uh, online registration, uh, e-fax prescription uh, directly from the EMR. We, we imported all the pharmacies in BC. So there's directly from the College of Pharmacists, so there's no way that we could get a wrong fax number. Uh, video calls with two-way WebRTC, browser to browser, no external servers, no way someone can record the call. 
Um, and the app. Awesome. Dr. Mike, we got about 30 seconds left or so. Okay, here's the AI and ML clusters. I've gotten funding for six students. We'll be starting in January from different uh, disciplines at UVic, UBCO. I've got a couple graduate students also working through my tax cluster grants. Uh, we, we bring on four or five students in the summer to do biking here in Big White because they want to come here. We bring four or five students in the winter to come here because they want to enjoy this environment. And we're introducing them all to open source software. And I hope they uh, do something interesting with it. Thank you very much. There's Ski Patrol, my clinic on the bottom right. There's Ski Patrol, upper left. And there's the cars we use to drive people around in Big White because there's no ambulance here or any public services to speak of. So, um, wow. Uh, so I just want to commend you. We don't have time for, for questions, but as I was listening, it, this is such an incredible resource. Um, what was really, what really hit for me was the patient and physician perspectives that you included. Um, and just the ability for you to be doing this kind of work from Big White and having other people from all over internationally help contribute. So it, it's not just an incredible resource, but also an ex excellent example of how we, we think about including people within our, our different um, projects. Um, so I just, uh, like I said, I, I personally have a ton of questions for you. Um, and I know there's other questions, but unfortunately we don't have time. I just want to say thank you so much for your, for your time. And uh, for sharing this incredible information with us. Before we finish, there's one thing I should mention. All of these students are getting funding 75 to 50%. And there's a lot of programs out there through the Work Initiative Learning Program and other government resources that can pair a, a program with a physician to create work. And I'm glad you brought that up because again, being able to think of a studentship within these projects is incredibly important, especially as we think of future, um, you know, future trajectories of, of research and how we train our folks. So um, thank you again um, and uh, have a really good day. Hope you continue to join us for the rest of the, the talks today. Thank you. There's a sandbox online. Those are the accounts. There's no live patient data. People can try it out as a provider or a patient. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Without further ado, we're going to jump into our next presentation. I am going to let you uh, folks just roll a little bit past our time, but we've got some wiggle room at the end, so not to worry. Um, so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Erica, Dr. Johnson, and Dr. Snadden. I believe I've got everybody. Can you just make sure? Crystal, I think you're in there as well. Um, just introduce yourselves and your presentation. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, um, welcome to our presentation on the Rural Site Visits Project. I'm Crystal Wong, a project coordinator with the RCCBC, and I'm joined with Erica Belanger, and she's our research coordinator and data analyst. Um, and as she's pulling it up, we're just going to be sharing with you today the process that we've developed um, to, to learn about how can rural community engage healthcare um, services planning affect sustainable healthcare system changes. Um, yeah, so this is just us um, on our respective site visits. We feel so lucky and privileged to be able to go out to communities, um, visit them, meet with them, and feel very welcomed by rural communities. And a bit about our project. So we're funded by the Joint Standing Committee on Rural Issues, and um, we're seeking to go out and connect with all 201 RSA communities between 2017 and maybe later than 2021, um, considering we've been hit with COVID. Um, and the purpose is to hear directly from community members around their thoughts um, surrounding health care delivered for their rural communities. And we're using this information to better inform policy and program development, build stronger relationships between the JSC and rural health care providers, as well as um, build strong relationships with those directly on the ground. So we um, came up with the research question, which was how can rural community engaged health services planning affect sustainable healthcare system changes? Uh, so in order to address this research question, we really aim to uh, take a grassroots approach and speak directly to community members um, on the ground within um, their individual communities. And we also aim to collect multiple perspectives from a variety of community stakeholders. 
And we uh, recognized initially, um, this started off more of a quality improvement project, but soon after meeting with community members um, and picking up all the information, we really realized um, how valuable this was, um, especially on this large of scope. So to touch on our methodology, um, Dr. Charles Bolin um, created the partnership pentagram model, and uh, he argued that fragmentation exists in the health services uh, delivery system, which is exemplified by missing links, such as those between individual and community health activities, the public sector um, and the private sector, and health services providers and users. Um, so since Bolin wanted to strive for uh, unity in healthcare, he really argued that unity could be created through the collaboration and partnership of multiple stakeholders, um, such as those in policy academia, healthcare, and in communities. Um, so he further emphasized that approaches related to engagement in healthcare needed to be united and identified these five areas of um, principal stakeholder groups, um, which are essential to creating a movement towards unity in health service delivery. So what we've really done with the site visits project is we've taken Boland's model and we've adapted it um, to add a sixth partner known as a linked sector group, which includes partners such as uh, those in industry, nonprofit organizations and institutes related to healthcare and health improvement. Um, so just expanding on our methodology, we do use an appreciative inquiry approach, which is really a strengths based approach to bring about positive change with regards to health services or healthcare services. Um, with this project, we're also grounded um, in the ontological belief that multiple realities are constructed through our lived experiences and interactions with others, and also that data should thoroughly reflect participants perspectives and are contextually relevant. So when we go to a community, we meet with um, various partners following our adapted Bolin's model. So we meet individually with physicians, nurse practitioners, midwives, health administrators, First Nations, um, and municipality members. And then um, as our project has um, developed over time, we've also um, expanded our partner groups to meet with fire chiefs, um, community paramedics, and other community health organizations. Um, once we meet with these partners individually, we always try to do a combined partners group um, at the end where we take um, members from each of those groups and we bring everyone together um, with the hopes of really strengthening relationships directly on the ground. Um, on occasion, we do bring guests on our trips as well. So in the past, we've brought members from um, the Joint Standing Committee, uh, Rural Locums for BC, um, divisions, as well as members from the Ministry of Health. So in terms of our data collection, we collect information um, from participants through group interviews as well as individual interviews. So this just depends on um, how many people are willing to meet with us as well as their availability. Um, and before any material is presented to our funders, the notes are actually um, gathered and then reflected back to each participant. So participants have the option to actually um, change, add or delete um, anything that they feel is not actually reflective of their uh, true thoughts. Um, and then these interviews are audio recorded and transcribed. Um, so for our data analysis, the data we collect is qualitative data, um, which means that the units, units of analysis are words and phrases. Um, so we don't collect any numerical data. Um, we don't do any statistical tests or things like that. Um, so we analyze through um, a method called thematic analysis or content analysis, um, where we collect perspectives, experiences, and views from participants in regard to healthcare. And then we look for themes across those perspectives um, in order to help uh, organize our data, given that we have so many interviews to analyze, we use a software analysis program known as, as in vivo. Um, and this is really an iterative process. So what that means is that the themes um, are constantly reviewed and they're refined as more data is collected over time. Just to note, you got about two minutes left. Oh, sure. Um, so I'll just quickly touch on our results that we have um, a bunch of themes that have emerged, um, as well as overarching themes, um, relationships, autonomy and change over time. So these are the themes that went through all the data. Um, we disseminate our results through our JSC reports, community reports, which go directly back to participants and available for the public, as well as specialized reports. And we also have an innovations website that I'll let Crystal touch upon. Um, so as Erica alluded to, we have such a, Erica, can you go back? Yeah, um, we have quite a huge scale of um, 
amount of interviews that have come back. We've met with over 107 communities to date, um, held over 380 meetings. And I know Erica has like hundreds, maybe even thousands of pages of transcribed notes to go through and code. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of um, communities in the North left to visit, as well as more remote and indigenous communities for the second half of the project. Um, some of the feedback uh, we've been receiving so far is up on the screen, but um, so far we've been hearing the appreciativeness of community members um, that we're going out to them to actually understand their role context and listen to them. Um, and also that they would like to hear what other community members are, other rural community members are doing um, to help with their local healthcare challenges. Um, so that leads us to um, another piece of um, KT that we've developed um, through our site visits and innovations website. Um, because of all the feedback we've been hearing from communities, um, we wanted to find a way um, to share these back to the entire province. Um, so we've created this website um, as a bit of an invitation inventory. Um, where uh, they can collect um, information, cross-pollinate ideas, and form connections with each other. And we did receive additional consent so that um, contacts can be um, added to our website um, so that they can directly connect with one another. And yep, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, this is our site visits team. I know Dave may be on the line and um, Dr. Johnson wasn't able to join us, but we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, also, if you're interested in being visited by us, um, we'd love to come to your community. Yeah, it, it's Dave here. If I could make one comment, the, um, we're hoping to publish this data fairly soon and it may be available as a preprint in the next few days through Med Archive. And if anybody wants to look at it and give us some feedback, we'd be really grateful. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, so first of all, I, I just want to emphasize just the, the um, to the to the audience, just how incredibly um, important this work out work is and just that it's not been done like this. And as far as I can see, in terms of actually the the number of, of visits and the uh, high quality um, data that, you, that you're getting. And I've had the privilege to work with Crystal and Eric on other sort of qualitative research. And so hats off to you both, um, all of you, the entire team and, and Dave, thank you for the note on the publication because um, that's going to be really important. I think this is incredibly significant work um, and, and just really look forward um, and kudos to the, to the map, the interactive map. I think talk about knowledge translation, super important. Uh, so I commend your entire team uh, for this work. And uh, I know that uh, there will be questions. I'm sorry, we don't have a bit more time, but we'll make sure you get those questions. And please folks, uh, check out the, um, the website um, and Dave will, will be, Dr. Sadden will be really happy to see that publication. So well done, everybody. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. All right. So it's my pleasure now uh, to have, um, Diane Dunsmore Farley and Faye Weller. I hope I have said that name right. I think, um, Diane, I might have accidentally said your name incorrectly earlier, so my apologies. Can you just introduce yourself in your, um, in your presentation today? Yeah, for sure. And is, can you see it okay on the screen? Uh, not quite yet. Oh, okay. Jason, are you? Yeah, Jason, are you able to see it? N not just yet, no. So you'll just have to share the screen at the uh, bottom there, okay. the green button. Yeah, right. Sorry about that. No problem. Here's the green button. The green button and the Zoom call. You have to go back to the Zoom call and click the green button. Yeah, okay. Hold on a sec here. If I could figure out how to do that, I would. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Is that the Zoom? No, that's not the Zoom. No. It's at the bottom. It says share screen. Share screen. Oh, there you go. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Can you see it now?
There, it's coming. We got it. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to start. So thanks very much, everybody. My name is Diane Dunsmore Farley, and I'm here today with Faye Weller. You might want to turn off your video feed because it, it, it can't handle both. It's taking place, place on Gabriella. It's a ferry dependent community in the Salish Sea off Vancouver Island with a population. Okay, turn off my video feed. You see that, Faye? Okay, is that better? Much, yes. Sorry. Can you see it now? Can you hear me? Yep, you, we can hear okay. you. Okay, can see the presentation. So back to where we were. Um, here we are. Okay, great. So we're a ferry dependent community in the Salish Sea off Vancouver Island. We have a population of about 4,500 people. With a median age of 61, Islanders are generally better educated, but have significantly lower income, child poverty and homelessness. This is balanced by an engaged and responsive community. All ferry dependent communities stretch along the coast of BC. And these islands and other geographically isolated BC communities share some common features, supply chain vulnerability and limited access to social and health services. Understanding Gabriola's experience can provide useful knowledge for other small communities. Our research objective was to understand Gabriolan's experiences and actions during this pandemic and how we can use this opportunity to do things differently. To realize the objective, we asked questions that focused on well-being and social determinants of health, as seen in the diagram to the left, and respondents' experiences, changed behaviors, and potential societal shifts, as represented in the diagram to the right, showing the interrelationship of these factors. So long. <laughs> So based, this is based on a social ecological approach. Our design uh, draws on multiple lines of qualitative and quantitative evidence captured through a survey, key informant interviews, documentary sources, and census data. A specific focus is on vulnerable or traditionally underserved populations and workers. And like many of the other presenters today, we had a large number of survey respondents, 363, but 70 plus percent of them were female. So being an island creates a petri dish effect in which we can distinguish external impacts from those generated locally. So lesson number one, we learned that the top three contributors to the well-being of respondents during this time were social connections, core to people's well-being across age, gender, and income, two, connecting with nature. Many respondents commented on the delight of reduced noise from planes, boats, and cars, and the opportunity to hear the sounds of nature instead. Three, exercise from walking to biking to workouts. So how does this inform us going forward? First, keep parks open came through loud and clear. Two, ensure opportunities and communities for outdoor gatherings, for walking in nature and for exercise. And three, ensure opportunities for connecting online, for exercise and other classes and for connecting with friends and family. Lesson two, whether on the front line, front lines are working remotely, workers were more grateful, more anxious and more stressed than the general population. The top three contributors to workers experience during COVID were the age of the workforce, the majority on this island are over 50, income instability, job insecurity and the stress of constant change. How does this inform us going forward? A significant number of people worked from home. For some, this was a shift from worksite-based employment to home-based employment. For many, this was identified as a welcome change. A second major change was access to an array of government benefits, some of which ensured businesses could stay open and others that provided workers with adequate wages and supports. These findings suggest the need for policies, programs, and infrastructure supporting different work modes and ongoing provision of benefits and supports to ensure workforce sustainability. Gabriola has three physicians and between 800 and 1,000 unattached patients. With the complexity of COVID, work processes have changed. 
including enhanced safety precautions, increased telephone appointments, ongoing consultation with health authorities, and coordination across local services. Health professionals report increased mental health challenges for their patients and clients. Many patients experienced increased anxiety, require, which required patient-client education regarding pandemic safety and new processes for service access. A large older population and corresponding high proportion of, of complex cases, combined with new COVID safety processes, resulted in exhausted staff. What does this suggest going forward? Collaborative relationships and communications both locally and externally must be sustained and enhanced. How did we get back there? Sorry. Must be sustained and enhanced. Um, and funding support for local coordination is required for effective responsive service delivery. So lesson four was income stability. We found evidence of how important income stability was during COVID. COVID benefit programs were important at the personal level with reduced stress and anxiety corresponding to the minimal impact of COVID on income that we found in our research. Income stability was also key at the local business level, increasing the stability of small businesses, resulting in increased community resilience. And there was strong support by respondents for a universal basic income program. Some talked about the importance of income stability for their children and grandchildren. Others talked about the need to ensure more equitable wealth redistribution. These findings point to the need to advocate for the implementation of basic income security. Gabriel is linked to the majority of supplies as a ferry. When systems shut down, we're vulnerable to our ferry shutting down and losing our link to needed supplies. In the case of the pandemic, residents of Gabriola stayed on the island. We learned through this research the importance of increasing the resilience of Gabriola through growing, making, and buying local. The findings indicated an increase in buying local and plans to continue that trend after COVID. When asked about support for increased access to local food and products, 91% indicated they strongly agreed or agreed. So a final report will be shared with our community. We'd originally applied for funding through the Michael Smith Foundation, but were unsuccessful. So Faye and I just took this on on behalf of the community. So we'll be getting the report to them. We're also hoping to submit articles to academic journals. Community members express their gratitude to us for having the opportunity to share their perspectives. In turn, we're thankful to our community and to the, the Gabriola Health and Wellness Collaborative and Sustainable Gabriola for their support. We'd like to leave you with a little bit of Gabriola gratitude. <laughs> Love it. Love the last picture there. Um, and thank you uh, so much. Uh, we don't have time for questions, but I am going to give you 30 seconds because that was like inc another um, incredible um, presentation and research. Um, just very quickly, what do you think is the most important to consider from your findings as we move beyond uh, COVID into post pandemic times that that you want to keep just in 30 seconds one one item building local sustainability and resilience and building it with the community. Beautiful answer. Um, thank you so much. I love the, the little dance at the end. Um, really wonderful presentation. Thank you so much to both of you for your time today. Um, if you want to turn your camera back on and give us a wave, um, hopefully you can stick around. We've got one presentation left and um, there you are. Thank you so much. And I'll move us on to, uh, to the next presentation, Dr. Tricia Tang. Uh, Dr. Tang, if you wanna just introduce yourself and your presentation.
You're muted. Can you hear me now? Absolutely, thanks. Perfect, sorry about that. I thought I had everything prepared. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, to give you a little background, my name is Trisha Tang. I'm an associate professor in the division of endocrinology at UBC. I'm formally trained as a clinical psychologist and have an expertise in type one diabetes. And for the past 20 years, um, my research has focused on developing and evaluating low cost and sustainable care support models for improving um, diabetes related health and mental health. So when we talk about mental health and diabetes, it's diabetes distress, not depression, that's most closely linked with poor blood sugar control and worse health outcomes. So what is diabetes distress exactly? Well, it refers to the invisible emotional burdens, the relentless worries, the ongoing fears that patients experience when managing a complex chronic condition. And there are seven core dimensions of diabetes distress, powerlessness, feeling that no matter what you do, you have no control over whether you're going to develop complications 10 or 20 years down the road. Hypoglycemia distress, feeling scared that you're gonna have a severe hypoglycemic event in the middle of the night when you're sleeping or at some other inopportune time, like when you're driving a car. Negative social perceptions, feeling worried that if people find out you have type one, they're gonna treat you differently or they're gonna think about you differently. Eating distress, feeling like you're preoccupied with food and counting carbs all the time and you really just can't get a handle on your eating. Management distress, feeling that you're doing, you're not doing every single possible thing you need to do to manage your diabetes. Friends and family distress, feeling like your loved ones are hassling you all the time and they're making a much bigger deal out of your diabetes than they should. And physician distress, feeling like your physician and your doctor just really doesn't understand what you need or understand what you're going through. So is diabetes distress a problem in British Columbia? Well, my research team and I conducted a study um, with 58 adults with type one who live in BC, and this is what we found. This figure displays different levels of diabetes distress with the green bars um, representing no to low distress and the red bars representing moderate to high distress. And as you can see, the rates of moderate to high distress across the seven subscales range from 42% to 91%, with the highest distress categories being powerlessness and eating distress. Um, so if so many of our patients with type one are experiencing distress, why are they having such a hard time getting the help they need? I think there's three reasons. One, in Canada, as far as I know, there are only three clinical psychologists um, who specialize in type one diabetes. Two, psychologists are just not part of the healthcare team in diabetes centers in British Columbia. And three, provincial health coverage does not reimburse for psychological counseling. So our answer is we developed a, a proposal called T1D Reach Out, which is funded by the JDRF. And the objectives of Reach Out are to design a virtual care platform, or in other words, a mobile app that can deliver psychosocial support to adults with type one living in rural and remote communities in interior BC. Two, to investigate um, the impact of participating in a six month reach out intervention and to see if that will lead to reductions in diabetes distress. So our first task was to conduct focus groups and we recruited a geographically representative sample of 39 adults with type one all across interior. And so we had people as far north as Williams Lake and as far east as Kimberly. And our focus group findings showed that there were six key features that participants really wanted in the app, with the first one being a library of peer supporter profiles. Now think of this as Tinder for type one. So, but instead of browsing for profiles for a love interest, you're browsing profiles to find a peer supporter that really best matches your support needs. So in the profile, you have your basic demographic information, the peer supporter's name, how old they are, where they live in interior, 
um, what age they were diagnosed, which is really important because we've been seeing a lot more folks who are diagnosed as adults. Okay. They also, um, it also shows whether they're on a continuous glucose monitor or flash, um, whether they're using an insulin pump or multiple daily injections. Um, when we ask, you know, what are some of the most important things that you would consider when selecting a peer supporter, stage of life easily was number one. So a 20 year old university student um, who really worries about final exams and living far from home is really not gonna identify closely with a single mom of two young kids. Lifestyle was also an important consideration. We had one participant who is a recovering alcoholic and he had said he wanted to be matched with someone who also doesn't drink. Shared hobbies and interests really bind people together. We have one of our younger participants who is on the soccer team at our university and wanted to be paired with a peer supporter who's also an avid athlete. So once you select your peer supporter, you can communicate with this person one-on-one -on -one through text, audio, or video chat, whichever uh, modality you and your peer supporter like the most. Okay. In addition to individual support, you can access group support of the larger peer supporter and participant community using the 24-7 chat room. And if a small group of, let's say, five or six people are really interested in one specific topic that maybe not the whole community is interested in, so for example, intermittent fasting or traveling with type 1 um, during the COVID era, um, then you can take an exit ramp from 24-7 chat room and create your own discussion board. We have our virtual support sessions that are led by a peer supporter on a topic of their choice, um, something that they're interested in. And these are synchronous sessions that let's say on a Friday, um, January 8th at 7 p.m. So everyone can sign up. All of our group sessions are moderated and supervised by a health professional. And last but not least, our resource vault, which is the home for really important information like um, local mental health crisis hotlines, the latest scientific breakthroughs, um, or tips on how to disclose your diabetes status to employers. Dr. Tang, just to let you know, we got about a minute left. Okay, great. Um, so um, if we do find that this intervention does lead to reductions in the distress, our plan is to expand reach out to other age groups like adolescents who are transitioning from pediatric to adult diabetes care, and also expand to other rural and um, remote communities all over BC, like in the Northern Health Authority, First Nations Health Authority, Vancouver Island. Um, so we're really excited for um, the next steps. And I wanna thank our IHA team, which probably a lot of folks are on this call, Dee Taylor, Susie Wilkinson, Holly Bueller, Karen Maywald, Kim Peek, Holly Bueller, um, Anya Brock. So thank you so much for being a part of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tang. And again, I mean, I've had the pri privilege of working with you and, and really getting to know this, this project and just how important it is. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have we don't have really have time for questions. But again, I'll just maybe ask you um, to comment on the importance just overall of doing research in rural locations. Do you, can you just not just your research, which has been incredibly impactful and, and also has such a pragmatic um, uh, use, but just would you mind just tying off our, our session this morning just commenting on, on your thoughts around rural research overall? Well, you know, I think rural and remote communities are the mo one of the most marginalized communities and especially with topics like mental health. Um, you know, we just don't even have enough providers who specialize, I mean, who specialize in general psychology, much less psychology for diabetes and chronic illness. So it really is important to find more innovative ways. I think, um, you know, I don't want to be pessimistic, but we can't rely on the healthcare system to solve our problems. So as researchers, we need to be creative and think about what other community resources, homegrown resources are available that we can really draw on and train people, um, you know, in motivational interviewing, um, in behavior modification. It really is so important to look at what's in our existing community because those are the people that we can rely on and if we can show evidence that it's effective um, I think that is a great um, direction um, to head into. Brilliantly said and uh, with that I don't I don't have to add anything to it I think you you did my job for me. Um, <laughs>
<laughs> Dr. Tang. So I just want to let everybody know that this um, is, first of all, thank you to all the presenters. Thank you to the RCCBC. I want to take just a 10 seconds to put a shout out to Jason Curran, who really came up with this entire idea. Um, big kudos to you, Jason. This, I think this has gone very well as an inaugural event. We look forward to it next year. Uh, to all of the uh, presenters, again, thank you so much for your time and effort to put all these presentations in. To the audience for joining us um, and just really excited to see how much rural research is going on. Just, um, just, just a wonderful morning.